Hey guys, uh, welcome to Adventures in AI. I'm Connor. Just before we begin, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping rules. So, firstly, I'm from Northern Ireland, which means that it is competitive to speak at the speed of a bullet train. If you don't understand what I'm saying, please ask me to repeat myself, because if you didn't understand it, no one did. It's just the way I am. I'm sorry, folks. The purpose of this talk is to give you some cool tools to work with, but also to inspire you to get you thinking a little bit about why we should be doing AI within O3D and basically why you should care. Now, before we talk about my second favorite subject, which is AI, I want to talk about my first favorite subject, which is me, me, the presenter. So I'm an AI enthusiast and amateur hair dyer, but let's be fair, that was kind of obvious from the start. I'm 21, I'm from Ireland, and I'm just fresh out of college, a university from Queens, and just been working on some cool AI and ML stuff that I want to share with you today. I don't want to talk about myself too much because there's some exciting things on the agenda. Cool. So before we talk about what we actually have here, let's talk about why we want O3D to be taking part in AI. Some estimates from Bloomberg in terms of the growth of the AI market shows that actually it's going to outpace the metaverse, which is insane because they're in completely different stages of growth. The metaverse is all cool and flash and hip. And AI, it's, it's been around for a while. We've had a couple of AI winters, and we're really waiting to see some good projects come out of it. So the fact that this growth is still predicted is insane. More importantly, O3DE is the perfect tool set to take on the new challenges coming up in AI. We've had our machine learning, we've had our more basic algorithms, we're now moving into a field of reinforcement learning. So that's when we're getting AI to do more interesting things like drive our cars or operate our warehouses. And O3D as an open source platform is perfectly positioned to take advantage of this. In fact, if we have a community interest in this, and if we invest in this more, then we can have the future of AI not being built by big, scary governments or some scary man in a hat, but by a community. And I don't know about you guys, but that sounds pretty cool to me. So before we begin, let's go over our agenda. First, we'll talk about the underlying technology and how we can get some neural nets working inside of O3DE without any external configuration. We're going to be using O3DE's shader technology because it's very well suited to the parallel computing that you need to do in order to train neural networks. After that, we're going to talk about some simple joints. That's a very basic reinforcement learning task and how you can build that into some pretty interesting stuff, including building a human hand that only knows how to, well, probably poor choice of words here, but only knows how to grab balls. Outside of that, we're going to do some swarm intelligence. That's the idea of distributing a task and getting lots of things to work on solving a problem instead of one big ugly network just mining it down. And then after that, we'll have time for questions at the end. I do like to keep these sessions interactive, so if you do have questions, please just raise your hand and I'll be very happy to answer them. Cool. So this is just to get your interest. This is just a quick overview of what we're doing. You'll be seeing lots of live stuff inside of the presentation, and you'll also be seeing a little bit of O3D at the very end. Now, I'm sorry, on the agenda, it said there was going to be some live dodgeball. I'm sorry I can't make you the king of middle school anymore. The dodgeball will be part of a play session later on, which I'm excited to talk about. Cool. I've talked enough. Let's get into it. So let's talk a little bit about how the renderer Atom works inside of O3DE. There's lots of layers, and that's what helps make it so powerful. The part that we're going to be focusing on is the shader system. So we have our scene, which is something that we've all seen when we open up O3DE. Our render pipeline, it's the manager of everything that goes on behind the scenes. It tells you what to do and tells you where to go and put things when you need to. And the render hardware interface, that interfaces with our GPUs and all of our very, very cool hardware that runs all our big tasks. That's all fine, but the part we want to focus on now is the shader system, because that's the technology that we're going to be exploiting to build some neural nets. In case you don't know anything about shaders, uh, don't worry, you're not alone. I didn't know much about shaders before starting into this. The headlines are that they're very fast, they can do lots of things at once, and they're very well developed. So instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and trying to implement lots of new neural networks and doing things that you don't really need to do, we can use the existing technology inside of O3DE that we know works and that we know will continue to be supported. Again, once again, if you're not too familiar with the shaders, we have our vertex fragment and compute shaders. The first two, these are visual, these do things on the screen. The compute shader, this is our third one that we're going to be focusing on, it does stuff really fast to keep things nice and simple. You don't need to worry about too much about the inner mechanics, we're gonna be going through that as we go. Cool, so lastly, before we go on to something interesting, why are we using this shader structure? Why don't we just reinvent something? The shader structure is extremely similar to how we want a neural network to work. We want to distribute a task, we want to do lots of small things at once, and then we want to add up our results at the end so that we have something that's useful. Cool. So, this is the very, very humble beginnings of reinforcement learning inside of O3DE. What you're seeing, it's very simple, it's two cylinders connected to a joint. 
this joint here is actually being controlled by a compute shader in the back end. So it's not being controlled by a Lua script or some clever scripting. It's being controlled by a compute shader that is passing off different values and different parameters to a neural net in the back end. This neural net is tiny. It's, I think, 11 by 2 parameters. And to give you some context, Facebook's neural nets for face detection are normally about 3 or 4 million parameters. So this is very, very tiny. The idea behind this is that you have a very simple joint that you can reuse over and over again and can build bigger things with. But obviously, before you build stuff with it, you have to make sure it works. So what we did here is we began to train a joint to understand the idea of an objective. And that might seem very, very basic to you and I, but this is a shader. This is just a compute shader that knows nothing. You haven't told it what to do, so it needs to understand the idea that performing an objective is good. What we've had it do here is we've had it try and connect its rod inside of this box and hold it there. So it's a coordination task, and that's very, very important for movement later on. It didn't quite get the idea the first time around. It found that if it could hit its rod through this box over and over again, it could get quite a nice high score. But eventually, it did get the idea. And you see here what's happening is the neural network is moving its rod to position the box, which it can see inside of the O3DE engine. And then it is holding it there so it gets the maximum score, so it maximizes its objective. This is all running, well, when I recorded it, this was all running inside of the editor. So you could run this almost like a video game level. All good so far? Sick, awesome. So this is where things get a bit more fun. Obviously, having one joint that sort of moves around by itself isn't the most amount of crack you can have. So what we start doing is we start chaining joints together. And this is when we have to introduce a little bit of group theory. I'm going to talk so much about group theory, you're going to be bored of hearing me talk about it by the end of this session. But for now, all we're saying is that these joints here, they're chained together, and they have an understanding of one another. So let's look at this finger at the very end here. It knows that all it can do is it can rotate its middle joint. It can't rotate this end joint here. It has to pass on values to a different neural net. And as illustrated here, we have an individual finger movement, and we are slowly building this up. This is the idea that I sort of want to get across. We are building things together. It's not about making Roman a day. It's about making cool tools. So I'm sorry. I have to talk about maths. It's AI. Before we talk about how this all works and how we can do something interesting with it, we have to focus in on a subject called group theory. Group theory is fascinating. It completely changes how you look at maths because it takes away the numbers and puts in ideas and systems and functions and says, how do two things interact? What happens if you move A to B? Now, this is relevant because when we chain together our joints, we are chaining together a series of neural networks. So it's not just one neural net that's controlling several joints. It is several joints being controlled by several neural networks. And what you can do is you can train them in parallel and sit there for hours and not do much. Or you can be a little bit smarter. You can start passing parameters. You can start saying, OK, what have you learned? What can I learn from you? Think about how your fingers work in your hand as a very basic example. If, say, you're carrying a bag and you drop it, you know which finger dropped it. That's hardwired. And there's a reason for that, because that's evolution. There's a good reason why you can tell which finger hurts, which finger you know, is too hot, too cold. You are identifying where the error is, and you are doing what you can to correct it. It's the same idea that we're sort of carrying through. Oh, now this one I quite like. I'm going to have to time myself on this, because I could talk for hours about this. Galois theory, um, not Galois, as some people like to pronounce it, talks about, OK, how can we make group theory useful? How can we relate it to the things that we already know in maths? So it gives a relationship between number theory, which is you know, your 1.5, your square root of 2, all that fun stuff, and groups. So it says, OK, what happens if I stretch these numbers out? What happens if I have a set of numbers and I have a similar set of numbers? How can I transform one into the other? And this is relevant because we're going to be considering each of the neural nets in our joints as part of a group. Now, you should be terrified of the fact that I put a blank slide up here, because it means that I'm going to be talking. Galois theory to share error across multiple networks is just an idea of making training simpler. So when we train neural networks, they're often far too big for us to update every single thing in it. A neural net is basically a series of linear equations, if you're not too familiar with them. And each, uh, I don't want to use the word coefficient, let's say each number in your linear equations does something. It will move a value up, it will move a value down, it will make your joints do whatever. The idea here is that instead of having all these numbers that you know are related, but you can't relate them, is you implement a little bit of Galois theory, and you say, OK, you, neural net who has the joint on the finger, for example, I know that when you bend, I can lift stuff up, so I'm going to send that information to the wrist. So if the wrist bends, oh, I can also lift stuff up. It's a very simple idea, but it comes so simply to us because it's hardwired into us. This is not hardwired into computers, and it's not hardwired into neural network architecture. So we have to do a little bit of fun stuff with the Galois theory. I think 
there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of applying group theory to AI as well. So in case you're interested, have a Google. It's actually not too hard. I wanted to do a little bit of a comparison before I show you some of the cool stuff. When we implement a Galois theory neural net series, so that's just a bunch of joints that are together and are powered by neural nets, we see dramatic increases in performance. And that's because instead of all of the networks learning individually, they're passing on the knowledge from one to the other. They are saying, okay, I know that when I dropped something, it was bad. And I know when I bent my fingers, something could move up. It seems like a very simple insight, but once again, it's a very powerful one. So this little freaky automaton here is running inside of O3DE. Um, and it has learned all by itself how to grip a ball and stop it from moving when gravity is applied. Now, it looks pretty freaky, and it's definitely going to haunt my nightmares for a while, but it is a very interesting, yeah, it's a great example of AI breaking stuff. AI doesn't really care what you think. It'll just do what it can. I think, and I can't really say because, again, it's not my hand, but I think the idea here is to flick the fingers back and gain some forward momentum and then be able to grip the ball just before it drops. This not to pat myself on the back too hard, this is incredible. All this joint knows, and all these series of joints knows, is that if I drop the ball, it's bad. That's it, that's all we're telling it. And from that, it has learned to curl its fingers, the fingers have learned to coordinate, and the thumb has learned to move, as you'll see one more time. Where is it? Yes. You see the thumb tucks in underneath the palm there. And what that does is it means that the fingers can apply pressure from one side, and the thumb can apply pressure from the other. This was learned in about two hours, and once again, I cannot stress, this is really, really cool. All these fingers can do is grip this ball, and that's their only knowledge of the world, and they've learned coordination that we, as animals, have evolved over hundreds of millions of years to do. I'm really impressed with it. I don't care. Oh, everyone good so far? Talking too fast? No? Awesome. Cool. This is going so much better than my rehearsal. Okay. So, we've seen some semi-cool stuff. Let's talk about some swarm applications and swarm AI. So, before we begin, what is Swarm AI and why should you care? I talked a little bit about it at the start. It's the idea of distributing a task. Um, take, for example, even things like face recognition. You don't necessarily want one big ugly neural net that is very hyper-specific and is only good at doing one thing to be recognizing your faces. You want to be diverse. You want to introduce new ideas when you can. So, when you have a swarm of workers collaborating, you can introduce these new things. You can swap out workers. You can say, okay, that didn't work, that's fine, I know it was you. I can make a small change to my network and expect a small result. <coughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, this is really, really hard to do. We see insects do it all the time. Humans aren't still really sure how they do this. Um, it's a big area of study, and it's one of the last mysteries of biology, really, how these swarms work. But we can implement a couple of ideas, again, taking from mathematics. You may have seen some of these uh, drone shows. This isn't true swarm AI, but it's a great example of coordination outside of nature. And the idea here is to apply these small workers that are each doing small things and create something bigger, greater than the sum of its parts. I think the buzzword today is synergy. Cool. So before I demo this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the 2D simulation environment we've made inside of O3D using the Amazon Shader language. It's based off of a legacy system called Amaze, developed by the US Air Force and Air Force Research Labs. They've since phased it out because it was so good that they decided to get rid of it. Um, but it's a very simple idea. You have vectors, everything's well visualized. Our task that we're going to be focusing on today is the idea of finding a fire within a zone. So again, it's going to be similar to our joints. Our UAVs are going to be very, very simple in terms of what they know, in terms of what they can do. All they can see is, OK, fire below me or not fire below me. That's the idea. And again, it comes back down to the idea of building complex systems out of simple parts. All these symbols here I can refer back to if you need, but hopefully everything will make sense. Now I want to talk a little bit about the architecture here and the ideas behind this. I talked a little bit about group theory earlier on. Group theory doesn't exist in the numbers. It exists in the architecture. It exists in how you organize things rather than what you tell them to do. So we had to do a little bit of fudging with our swarm network. We had to say, OK, you need to do more sharing. How do we share this information? How do we share these numbers? Well, we can take some ideas from fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics is very, very general. It talks about the idea of flow. It talks about the idea of things moving in the universe and how they move. So if we take this idea and apply it to the knowledge that is moving between the network components, then we can actually get some really interesting results. So I'm going to play this a couple of times, and then I'm going to explain what's going on.
cool. One more time. Great. So these UAVs, they are told that they have seven seconds of game time to work out the shape of this wildfire. They don't know what the shape looks like. They only know that inside of this yellow box, there is something to be found. And each time they cross the boundary between fire and not fire, they draw a little point. They make a little note of it. Their goal here is to guess the shape. So what are they doing when they actually approach? You see that UAV 1, 2, and 3 are actually coordinating. They're going to different corners of the map. The first one to find it, I think, is UAV 1, because it starts scrubbing from the top left corner downwards. Once it finds it, it passes on that information to UAV 3, and that starts doing a circling motion. UAV 1 is working out the shape inside of here. UAV 3 is trying to calculate, OK, is there anything that I've missed here? This was a fair few hours of development. I think this was 30 hours of training to get this kind of coordinated behavior. But I think it's really impressive to be able to understand what is going on here and to see a repeatable pattern that can be reapplied is pretty cool. Maybe I'm patting myself on the back too much. No, I'm not. I think it's cool. Cool. So I want to talk a little bit about the philosophy that we're going to be embodying here. And somehow we are already approaching the other talk. Damn, I'm doing really well for time. Cool. So this work, we're not keeping to ourselves. We are making it open source. Things are better when shared, absolutely. And my idea is, honestly, I'm a bit boring. I want to see what other people can do with this. And I think, again, there's lots of low-hanging fruit in terms of implementation and in terms of the ideas that are expressed. So this will be made available on a GitHub. Don't worry, you can come find me at the Mixer, buy me a drink, maybe. Um, you'll be able to get this GitHub link. And we'll also be putting it on the O3DE site as well. Cool. So. The thing that I want to emphasize to you most of all, and hopefully in this quick presentation I have done that, is that there's some really interesting stuff to be done here. There are some really, really interesting problems to be solved, and giving a foundation for that I think is the most important part of all. If you haven't found this presentation interesting, that's fine. As long as you go home and Google something and have a little bit of curiosity, then I'll be happy as Larry. Cool. Now, I hope to have lots of questions, otherwise I've just made you all bored. In case there are any confusions, these are the subjects that we went over. But yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Wow. Yeah, I guess boring. Oh, okay. Now I can do. How was your learning curve to figure out the shader system of O3D and Atom for that matter? Oh, a nightmare. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've used the documentation much. Um, it's pretty sparse. A lot of it was just taking from the physics stuff, and I had to, I ended up looking at lumberyard videos, I think, in the end. Um, so yeah, in terms of building out shaders from there, it was pretty slow. Um, the hardest part, I think, was actually the memory management on the GPUs. It just, maybe I'm just not very good at coding, that's also an alternative, but it just was not behaving, and things were trying to, yeah, I'm not going to start talking about it, because I'm just going to get grumpy and mad about it. Um, but yes, tough learning curve, but certainly a worthwhile one. You're making it too easy for me, guys, honestly. So when you, when you mentioned that you had several neural networks working together, mm -hmm. uh, how big was each, each uh, network? 11 by 2. So you could call it an MLP. It was basically doing nothing. Um, but when you put these things together, you can have parameters that are shared. So if I were to illustrate it a little bit better, yeah, imagine a hive of bees. Each bee can only do a very small thing. But because of their collaborative nature, because they can share things, then they come together. So within one hand, there were, uh, I do maths and I can't do 11 times 2, hang on, 220 parameters shared. So it's 15 of those, no, 10 of those networks inside of one hand. But you can consider it to be one larger 220 parameter network because they're all sharing ideas and information between each other. That sort of makes sense? Yeah. Cool. I was expecting to get grilled in this question session. This is awesome. No hard ones? Cool. In that case, that's my time, folks. Thank you so much.